Without further ado, I'm going to let my panelists introduce themselves, tell them a little, tell you guys a little bit about what they do, and then we're going to get into a very food for thought, thought provoking discussion for sure. Why don't you start, Rue? Thank you. Oh, my mic is on. Okay. I wasn't yeah. sure. Yeah. On. Um, thank you for having me. My oh, name is Rue Johnson. Oh, sorry, sorry. We good? We good? Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. You, you want to sit on this? You know what? Quick decoration. This is in the C suite. You got it? Okay. okay. Yeah, that's... Thank you. And then you can sit on. You can sit on huh? that. That's actually a chair. Oh, it is? Yeah. Okay. Bet. I'm already short, though. This is what I forgot. Yeah, I'll sit there. No, 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 no. It's fine. Here we go. Broccoli Con's all about being real, y'all. So yeah, yeah. we keeping it in a hundred right now, all the way. Go ahead, Rue. Um, thank you. I'm glad you're okay. Um, my name is Rue Johnson, and I am the CEO and founder of Rue Black Consulting. We are a creative consulting firm, and we work with people, places, and things that want to expand their consumer demographic with a specific emphasis on hip hop and digital marketing and campaign development, which is really a long way to say that we throw parties, big ones. <laughs> Awesome. Parties um, with a purpose. Though. Yes, parties with a purpose, yes. 100%. Uh, my name is Brandon Pankey. I'm Vice President of uh, Business Development and Operations for Live Nation Urban. I work alongside Heather Lowry, who just moderated the, the previous panel. I'm also Executive Director of Destined to Achieve Successful Heights, which is a, a music business program that teaches students about the business of entertainment. A lot mm -hmm. of our young people want to be rappers or want to be athletes, but don't understand that you could be a lighting director or you could work for YouTube and you can have um, a sustaining career uh, in the music industry. Uh, my name is Chuma Basa. I work for YouTube. <laughs> and, uh, director of Urban Music there. Um, spent the majority of my career as a music curator, music programmer, uh, Spotify, and then it revolted MTV, and then BET here in DC before that. I see some BET DC people, that's right. Yes. I have to shout out DC. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, it's me. I'm Sean Glover. I'm the Director of Industry Relations at Sound Exchange. Uh, Sound Exchange collects and distributes all the digital streaming royalties in the music biz. So we're, um, you know, at the front of where music is being consumed and we make sure artists get paid. Mm, that is important for sure. All right, let's talk about when you all first fell in love with music. Tell me a little about, about you, when you first fell in love with music and how that led to your passion of being involved in the industry? Um, well, I think for me, I have always had an inherent like closeness with music and also with sound as a storytelling mechanism. But I think that I knew I was gonna work in the music industry without even having the actual tools to know what was happening um, was when I saw MC Hammer in concert for the first time and I was like a kid. Wow, you know? and I that's remember, special, like, that's the clap. I haven't really, seen him in concert, yeah, so dang. Also, I'm, I'm gonna be 35, <laughs> so you know, just let you know. Um, but I remember when, you know, the lights went down and there was this like collective holding of breath from everyone around. And next thing you know, you know, he exploded out with so much energy. And I remember literally like in Vogue being his, you know, backup singers. It was just so beautiful and so um, collective what I felt with everyone else in the room. And I knew even at that young age, no matter what, that I was going to like recreate that feeling um, forever and ever and ever, which is kind of what drove me to working in the music industry at a higher level. So, and that was when I think I don't know, maybe 1991, wow. two. What about you, Brandon? Yeah, I'm gonna show my age Same, right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but no. Flashback um, Friday. <laughs> yeah, real. I was about four and there was a, um, a cartoon on ABC called California Raisins. And they used to say, um, I heard it through the grapevine. And when I heard that song, like it just resonated a lot. Like to this day, Marvin Gaye, I heard it through the grapevine is one of my favorite songs. And so from there, I just love music. I love listening to music, but I started, to pay attention to the business of music. So I you know, started getting subscriptions to The Source and to Vibe um, when I was probably about like 11 or 12. And I was paying attention to you know, the Russell Simmons of the world and the Puffs of the world, like you know, growing that conglomerate versus just being in music and using music to kind of funnel all of your other interests. And so from there, you know, I just love this industry and I love the opportunities that it gives us specifically to do you know, incredible things in our lives. Uh, for me, I have to give all the credit to my, my father, my dad. Uh, he was, he still is a huge fan of music. When I, when I was a kid, we weren't allowed to have the record player, I'm showing my age again, and the TV on at the same time. And I used to be like a TV junkie. 
And then, so we'd take off the TV, and then he would be on his typewriter, uh, typing and playing music, and then I started liking the records too. And I started going through the records, I started reading the, the, the credits, uh, memorizing words, uh, even trying to make my own music, and, and then find my own uh, voice, my own taste uh, as a teenager. Uh, and then that's, that's really like when stuff like hip hop was really starting to really, really come up. And, and then, like Brandon, digging deeper, finding out what, what goes on behind the scenes. Uh, it was actually, it's funny you say the, the Russell Simmons thing is that, that, that uh, uh, I remember reading the Black Enterprise when Russell Simmons was on the cover. Mm -hmm. I remember the library, I remember the seat I was in, in the, within the very library, I remember that issue so well. And I, and I remember checking out a book, and I remember and then getting a speech from somebody who was on the other side who was telling me about, hey, why don't you look in to see what's behind the scenes? And it uh, caused me, yeah. So, yeah, so it's always, it's been older people, my, my dad, yeah. Well, I don't know about those old heads. Me was Lil Yachty <laughs> <laughs> two years ago. Yeah, yeah. I heard Lil Yachty, that's what I felt like. <laughs> Lil Boat? Next question. Uh, no, um, I mean, you know, shoot, I, I'm black. I blew, grew up in a black household. You know, your mom. Where did you it. grow up? Chicago, okay. South Side Chicago. So, you know, your mama cleaning up in the morning, Saturday, it's, you know, yep. Earth, Wind, and Fire. It's that soul music. But I had a, what's funny, two days ago, I had a different answer to your question. It was, my first answer was, um, uh, I heard the Sugar Hill Gang. It was on the radio in the car. I was riding with my mom, and it was, I, I wanted to buy that record, that song. I just thought it was funny, the hip hop, the hippie to the hippie. -de. I just thought that shit was the coolest mm -hmm. thing. And I begged her and cried for her to buy that album. But then she went up me last, you know, yesterday. Um, she was, she's cleaning out her stuff. And she had a picture of my music teacher in preschool was this lady named wasn't Shaka Khan, but it was Shaka Khan. I was like, Mom, what the mm. fuck? She was teaching music. Wow. She's like, yeah, she wasn't a good teacher. I was like, good, good, good. <laughs> but it was, uh, she's like that, she's like, she was teaching the kids music at that time. So definitely the Chicago influences, the Earth, Wind & Fire, wow. all those people. Isn't it funny how everything really comes full circle? Man. I mean, that was just yesterday, and now I'm asking you a question today about Man. that. It's kind of yeah. crazy. Yeah. Before we get into really the community impact, can you guys share a little bit about how you got involved into the work you're involved in now and some advice that you can give people that are interested in being in the music industry? Um, I got my start, I guess, you know, always been a lover of, of music and, like I mentioned, the sound of storytelling. And so um, I started as a writer. You know, I was writing about music, interviewing artists, and I was working for multiple blogs, like, you know, when the internet really started cracking and I had a pen name. And so I would write and I would interview people, and that translated to a Village Voice publication, finding my writing and asking me to interview artists on a local level in Denver, Colorado, which is like very far from here. Um, <coughs> And was, Denver is not necessarily historically known as a place that cultivates hip hop music, but like Earth, Wind and & Fire and like other, you know, there is still that influence there. Um, and I found that when I started writing about musicians, um, the first step was trying to convince my superiors that I wasn't just talking about like Amateur Night at the Apollo, right? Mm -hmm. Like, look at these hip hop guys in their shoes, you know? So um, that was the first thing I realized was a challenge. And then what happened from there is I became a greater resource to the artists instead yeah. of writing about them. Okay. I found there were all these resources that were available that the artists weren't, especially the locals and the independent artists, weren't necessarily able to benefit from. So I became a greater resource to those artists by bridging the gap between those who have the resources and then those who create the environment that make the resources necessary. So that's where like my booking work started and um, the creative marketing and things and working on the festivals that all kind of developed out of the need to provide a greater platform for indies. Wow. Um, how did I get my start? I want to, you know, to, to emphasize what's important. There's a, a mentor in the room right now. Uh, Jerome Hips, who said very on, very, you know, very early in my career, um, you know, follow your passion. You know, no matter what happens, you know what I mean? Like the money is going to come if you actually believe and follow in what you want to do. Yes. So, let's, so let's backtrack. So I threw 
three parties. I don't want to say I threw parties. I threw like three parties um, in high school. <laughs> Two were trash. One sold out. Hey, and that's all that matters, right? <laughs> no. Uh, and uh, Not good enough for him. <laughs> and uh, But no, I mean, from there, obviously I was the one, you know, handling the operations. But like, you know, I was, you know, from there, I, like, I just love this industry and I really wanted to understand the business side of it. And so I attended the University of Penn. And Penn isn't a music school. It isn't, you know, really about music. But the one thing that Penn had were these great guest lecturers or adjunct professors who didn't work in, in academia. You know, one was a vice president of AOL. So I went to him. And that's when AOL, again, showing my age. You know, I went to him and I said, look, I really want to be in this industry. And he said, I knew someone at Viacom and, you know, got me an opportunity to intern at MTV. And so I interned at MTV in college. Um, and then... Uh, one of my professors, Michael Eric Dyson, uh, he brought a special guest to his class. Her name is Deanna Williams. She's a media coach. Um, she is, you know, really one of the founders of Black Music Month. And I persisted, you know, please, you know, anything you can do in Philadelphia. Shout out to Philly. I know it's not going to get a woo, but um, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. But no, um, you know, I said, I really need an internship. I really need an opportunity. And so coming from an Ivy League, and this is where passion comes in. You know, my mom cussed me out. She said, why are you going to get an internship mm. after graduating mm. from a top five school? I said, because I love music. Because if I go to healthcare, go to one of these other, you know, industries, I'm going to hate it and I'm going to hate myself and I can't be the best version of myself and every other, you know, cliche I can think of. And so I went and I was blessed to have an internship with Jerome Hips and Michael McArthur of Mama Boy, Mama's Boys Music Group, where at the time they managed Music Soul Child and a group of producers and songwriters. Um, and, and there, I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to learn how to A&R, and I'm going to learn how to songwrite, and I'm going to learn how to produce. No, they were like, look, we have this idea for a music business program that we want you to kind of, not, not kind of, we want you to put it together. And so, you know, I really developed the curriculum and, and, and helped to develop this music business program, and we had a pilot um, with 25 summer school students from the uh, school district of Philadelphia. And it was incredible. Every week we had them working with songwriters and producers, web designers. We brought in the vice president of a &R from uh, Warner Music at the time and just showed them different paths outside of just, you know, I want to be a rapper. However, it was an internship and it was free and I was broke. And so I went to Jerome and Mike and I said, look, I, I need a job. Their business manager at the time was looking for an assistant. I'll never forget that meeting. You know, I had that meeting. I had a big folder of all this creative stuff that I wanted to do. And he looked at me and he was like, you know we don't do no creative shit here, right? And I was like, okay, I just need a job. You know, quietly, we do a bunch of creative stuff now, but that's another um, story. But, um, you know, it was in a financial firm and I knew nothing really about finance. My major was communications and African-American studies. And so, and I'm, I'm gonna let everyone talk. I feel like I'm talking a lot. Um, from there, started off as his assistant and we had The Roots, Jill Scott and Kanye West pre-Trump Kanye wow. um, as a part of, oh. you know, as a part of his business management firm. And so I started to understand that. And we started to transition into managing the tours for these art artists. And I, I really started to like that and love that, really. And have a, I actually had an acumen for it. And so the first tour that I, I actually ran by myself was Queen Latifah. She was doing jazz at the time. And, you know, she had a jazz run at the House of Blues. And I fucked up. I remember there were like 10 things that I messed up on and I was like, I know I'm getting fired. Um, but to have that ability, the other piece of this is when getting into this industry is to have people that allow you to make mistakes so that you can learn and grow from yes. them so that you stop making those same mistakes. And so, you know, from there, that company was purchased, rolled up with a bigger management group. Um, and that management group was, uh, you know, Lil Wayne, Nicki Minaj, you know, Aubrey, you know, it was a, you know, a bunch of folks. Um, and we were purchased by Maverick, which is underneath the Live Nation umbrella, and it is now the largest artist management company in the world. Once inside Live Nation, you peel that back and you realize, and, and Sean G, who is um, you know, a partner in Maverick, you know, really realized Live Nation doesn't really do black music. Mm -hmm. you know, Live Nation can sign a check you know, when Jay-Z is here or when Beyonce is here. They can sign a big tour check, but they don't understand how to incubate artists. And so in 2017, that was the birth of Live Nation Urban. And, you know, you know, another, you know, key phrase, you know, I got to take it from a mentor is urban is a psychographic and not a demographic. I know we look at urban sometimes like, why are we saying urban? But that 15 year old in South Dakota, 15 year old white woman is listening to the same thing that the 25 year old black man in Brooklyn is listening to. And so you look at urban as a psychographic and we are focused on developing rap, 
you know what I mean, R&B, gospel, and really developing events and platforms. One that, you know, I hope you heard about Heather, who was uh, moderating the panel before, Conceptualize Femme Forward, which is about really creating all-female curated lineups in music and comedy and, and conferences and, and panels, yes. panel discussions, and really building, you know, the power of women. We partnered with Spotify for Rap Caviar. We've done a lot. Um, uh, of things, and, and we, we've only scratched the surface because ultimately it has to be about impacting communities yes. or none of this shit matters. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Tuma? Yeah, I, I, I got my start really, I, I credit internships. I, yes. I, I, did, I did three internships, well, two and a half. Uh, the first one, the place shut down while I was there. Okay. Right? This was, it, that was yeah. an interesting experience. Yeah, because also imagine. because First, and, and, I'm gonna, and, and there's a theme here, and I'm going to go off what Brandon said. Uh, the first, I did the first internship was in New York City. I took a bus from Iowa City. I was in, at University of Iowa. And the reason I did it was... How was that? How was that? It's not Man, that far from Chicago. I said, how was, was that? Oh, it was good. I liked it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what happens so is... A lot of cornfields. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right, go ahead. Deep but, thinking and meditating out I there. I, I, like, I, I feel I, it. I, I, had, I had a good time. I liked it. You know what I mean? And, then think, and also, I, it was, yeah, never mind. That's, a long, that's another question. So what happens is this. is uh, what, While I was at Iowa, I had developed some relationships uh, at Iowa and, and uh, some, a few professors of color. One of them at the law school was... Um, I had gone to law school with LL Cool J's lawyer, and, she, and I went to her, and I was considering law school at the time. It was, I was more to please my parents more than anything else, because I wanted to do entertainment, but they were like, music? No, we didn't we come here to this country to, for you to just, you know what I mean? Because I used to listen and do so much music when we were in Africa, because I'm originally from Rwanda, but I grew up uh, in Iowa when I was a kid, and then, then we moved to Zimbabwe. We got to talk about that. I came back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, then, then I came back. So, I'm out, I'm out there, and she's like, you're not gonna do it from here. You have to go like, uh, build and get uh, 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 experience in exactly. internships. Uh, like she said, so it was like, she was like a, a, a mentor of sorts. So she, was, she basically is like, go, go to like LA or New York or somewhere, but it's not gonna happen from here. At least not at that time. This, this is before the internet was really popping. So what happens is, I took a bus to uh, Greyhound had a special, $69 anywhere in the country. You know, took a bus, Iowa City to New York City. I stayed at my cousin's, made 800 cold calls. I know that because of the phone bill that came afterwards. I didn't know that they would charge per phone call in New York. So made 800 cold calls, connected. Even, even uh, I had just pledged Phi Beta Sigma. I had found all the chapters in New York because I didn't know anybody, right? And, and, and they were like, hey, Hey, talk to Anthony over at Polygram. Or we'll talk to, you know, what next? And then there was a guy named Charlie Austin. So I got something at EMI Records. EMI gets bought. EMI, the label, uh, the corporate company, buys Virgin in the UK from Richard Branson and makes Virgin their North American presence and folds the imprint, the EMI imprint in, 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 uh, in the US. So all of a sudden I show up to this internship that I worked so hard to get and the supervisors uh, packing, everyone is like gossiping, exchanging numbers. This is when you wrote down numbers on your on the papers. And then uh, he's like, can you help me pack? I was like, it's over. I was like, oh, wow, you didn't see the New York Post? I was like, no. And then, right. yeah, I was working for free. Just an intern. Yeah, 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 right. yeah, I'm working for free. I, like, I don't have money to buy a newspaper on the way. So, pow, next thing you know, uh, Charlie Austin was one of the, um, he, 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 he was, he had, a pledge dead uh, in Philadelphia. And uh, he said, oh, you should call this guy Theo, uh, Theo Settlemeyer. He was just starting his own law firm at the time. So uh, I got an internship um, there. So that's, so, that's, so that's half internship, one internship. And then that supervisor helped pack. When I get back to Iowa to graduate, he's like, don't come back to New York. I was like, why? He's like, Go get Remember, you went back to Iowa? I went, had to graduate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I'm not You're gonna, gonna go, talk to him. Yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna go to law school. I'll graduate. <laughs> satellite, <laughs> yeah, satellite. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but I ended up not going to law school, so it's okay. Okay. But but I, but, it was, but I, yeah. So I go back, and then what happens is so interesting. He sends. He says. He he. This is when you wrote letters. He sends me an article from the New York Times about Atlanta being the new Motown, right? And he's like, try somewhere else, get some experience, then come back. So that's where I got the idea to apply for internship at BET in DC. So you see Don Fong back there? Hey, Don, hey. 
Yeah. Raise your hand. Yeah. yeah well, actually, so I, I was interning at BT, broke, no thing, and Dawn actually, she was, she was, uh, this is why it's important to always just be good to people, because me and my boy Eric Parker were interns at uh, BT in DC in the, in the news department, and Deborah Tang was the head of the news department. Dawn used to give us some of the lunch that she didn't eat sometimes. Wow. <laughs> like, no, 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 it would be like Popeyes, and then like, oh, then they're like, hey, this is too much, you guys watch some. And we were so broke, we'd drink two liter of Cokes just to be full. Savage, like, right. You know I, mean? <laughs> I, I tore that not. chicken up. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> telling you, we were, we were cause it was un, cause remember we were unpaid internships. I can relate, yeah, yes, so I never got paid for any and either. Then it was a part of a program, it was called the Minority Leaders Fellowship Program that helped us get to BET, they knew George Curry, who was the editor of Emerge, and George Curry is the one who got a, a, our, our um, resumes to BT. And uh, what happened was they supplied housing, mm -hmm. and then your school gave you a small stipend, yeah. and then you uh, did internships. So that's how we, the both of us, me and uh, EP, that's how we interned. That's a, without a program like that, would have been impossible. I'd never even been in DC. I knew one person in DC at the time, and that was, he, he went to school with my dad, high school. He's the one picking up from the airport. In Iowa? No, kidding, Tanzania. kidding, kidding. Yeah, my dad went to high school in Tanzania. So what happens is, so that's the, so it, it, so it was a lot of like cold calling, a lot of uh, advice from yes. people. You see like the, the supervisor I helped pack, the, the professor at the law school who went to school with uh, LL Cool J's lawyer. And I, 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 I've kept all my letters of, um, of uh, uh, like the, uh, the when, uh, when they did, when they say no rejection rejection yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like that I, he doesn't even remember them. the word because it doesn't matter them. I have so many of them I have I still have them I still have them and it, uh, and at the time I knew there was be motivation but it was yeah but that's basically how it was through. Uh, those sacrifices and, and those relationships. Yes, that helped so, you grow. We gotta talk about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, no, I, I, I never knew. I, lo I love Iowa. <laughs> I never yeah, about yeah, you said yeah, Iowa. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. Go but but well, mine was, I'll be quick. It, mine was not as deliberate and intentional as my esteemed panelists. Um, once I got out of college, I, had a, I got a job here with uh, KPMG. It's like this big accounting consulting firm uh, doing tax work. You know, it was a job. I didn't give a shit. I was like, it was, I was, you know, I was making more money than I ever thought I would make in my life, but it was boring, blue suit, white shirt every day. So um, our practice moved to uh, Phoenix. You know, I, you know, it was cool, flying back and forth until you start getting sick every other week, you know, different climates. So then I got a job at Georgetown University at the Cancer Center, Lombardi Cancer Center, and I was, I was literally buying drugs. You know, I just tease, my, you know, tell my grandma I was a drug dealer. She hated that shit so much. <laughs> but I had an intern. It was around. I had a. I had a. Uh, what's it? A student worker. So you know, at Georgetown University, you don't you know those are pretty rich kids, and they don't need work study. So it was this girl used to walk by the office every day, your headphones sweats. And it's one day she was like, "Man, y'all need a, You need any um, student workers?" And it was like, "Hell yeah!" Because there, that's gold if you had a student worker to help you out. Anyway, that student worker was a singer by the name of A. Marie. I don't know if you remember her. Mm -hmm. So she was my student worker, so she was telling me, um, you know, she was like, yeah, I want to be a singer. It was like for a year and a half. And I was like, you'll never make it. You know what I mean? Wow. Oh, yeah, dream killed. I killed all the tribe. Negative Nancy yeah. all the way. Because, yeah. you know, I met her father, her family, and she was, you know, she came from a military family, and she's about to get this English degree from Georgetown, and I just, I just didn't know. But I was like, you'll never make it. So she used to get a quarter for me every day to take this, it's a, well, a G2 bus from Georgetown to Howard to meet this producer at McDonald's on Howard's campus. Yep, Georgia I, Ave, we I all know like, that McDonald's. Yeah, you know, I was like, girl. Got some HQ people in the building, right? <laughs> and I, you know, I was like, girl, he's just trying to hit. He is, this is crazy. <laughs> she like, Sean, nah, not this for real, so hey, keep it in honest. But she would she would come back with like paperwork and we trying to figure this shit out together. I don't know what the fuck this is. So she was like, Yeah, we going back back to the studio, you know, studio. I was like, hey, this is some bullshit. Your father gonna kill me. You and me, you know. So and it was also the parallel time. I had a good friend in Chicago I grew up with who was a hip, is a hip hop artist. You know, he had three albums out and I was, you know, he had a video on BET, Rap City. 
Common. Oh, okay. And I was like, are you still sleeping on your mama couch, man? You on TV. I was like, some of this, this math ain't adding up. So I, start, I got interested in, uh, you know, show business. I tell people that show business is two words, you know, and we focus way too much on the show. So I just, I wanted to understand more about how things worked. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're the ones, and my other good friend, Derek Dudley, uh, who's commerce manager, we were just trying to figure shit out. So it was also during a time where music sort of flipped on his head. That's when, when people were selling CDs, I mean, I, Sean G knows, I mean, whoever else from back in the day know, when they were selling CDs, everybody was eating good. When the internet came, when yes. digital came, and then became, when the file sharing came out, it turned everything upside down. So I was just following the news and there was this, I was, there was this woman in D.C. at the RIAA, Recording Industry Association, her name is Hillary Rosen. Um, you can see she's like a political pundit now on all the little shows, but she was the president of the Recording Industry Association. Um, so I was like, she's making a lot of noise. There's a lot of people mad about this file sharing and they're trying to kill this industry. So I, you know, I would just say, thank God these stalking laws weren't as strong as they are now. Mm. We wouldn't be here, to, I wouldn't be here to tell that story. <laughs> but I just, I just went to her, I was like, what is, and then I found out it was in D.C. I was like, what is this music thing in stuffy ass D.C.? Right. You know, conservative D.C. So I emailed her, we talked a few times, and she's like, listen, we, we're good at the recording industry, but this new thing, this digital streaming service that's gonna pay the artist is just getting started. Maybe you can help there. What was it called? Sound Exchange. Okay. So we, um, you know, we went, just to give you the numbers of how crazy things were in like 11 years, 12 years, our first distribution was $1 million for the year. To date, we paid out $600 billion. Wow. So the, the, wow. the, 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 the consumer, like we are not concerned with um, obtaining music. Remember those 500 CD things you motherfuckers yeah. used to have? Yeah, I got that song. <laughs> yeah. Now you can have your whole, you know, catalog in the credit card. So even though buying music is down, consumption is through the roof. Like we're listening to more music than we've ever had at any time. You can't, you know, buy a car. You can't go into an elevator. You can't go anywhere without music being streamed. So it, it was a pleasure to be at the forefront of the digital explosion. You guys really have all seen the rise and revolution of that for sure. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Before I get to my next question, if someone is driving a beautiful gray Rolls Royce, it needs to be moved. So whoever's got the Rolly, okay, psych. <laughs> Please remove that. <laughs> next question is, we all know that music and making money off of music allows us to invest back into our communities. We also know that we all have a story when it comes to our jobs and our title of whether it's somebody come up, coming up to you, an artist or a person saying, thank you, you helped me figure out my passion or dream, or thank you, you made me figure out I don't want to be a rapper, I want to be an executive in the music industry. Do you guys each have a personal story in regards to somebody or an event happening that you guys have curated where it made you realize what I'm doing truly matters and is impacting firsthand people in the community? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you, you I mean, want me to start? You want to go? Whoever I, wants I'll go, to go. quick. Yeah. I just remember, uh, real quick, two things. During Hurricane Katrina, um, mm. it was uh, uh, it was that Friday. I guess the, the storm happened on maybe Tuesday, well, Monday, and then it was like Friday. Uh, first of all, let's... Yeah, it was a weird wave. It was, it was, it was two waves. Yeah, yeah, it was two like, parts yeah, to yeah, it. Yeah, it was, yeah, and let's be yeah. clear. Like, I, I, I hate that narrative that people died in the hurricane. No, right. people died because there was neglect. It was five days where people weren't getting served, mm. the, where the U.S. let these people down. Yes. And what made it even more fucked up is, if you remember, a week before that, there was a tsunami where they got water halfway around the world in a half a day when all these people needed was water. <clears throat> so anyway, so these people were displaced, and in New Orleans there's a lot of jazz musicians, so these people yes. were I mean, all over the world. We know where they were, and there was a distribution about to happen. Uh, so they've lost instruments. They're just in shelters. So one, this, uh, I forgot who it was, a gentleman that headed the Jazz Foundation called me, and 
we had the, the foresight to pull those checks because um, they were still getting, a lot of them were still getting checks. Wow. And just to hold them till they got settled. I was about to say, because yeah. who knows where they could have ended up. You know, and then we held them, and then when they, when they got where they were for a little bit, we, were, we sent them to them. And, you know, I sent out a lot of money and a lot of big checks, but it was calls from, you know, for checks, $40, mm. $400 saying, you, you saved my life. We wow. were about to, I was about to go drive a cab. I was about to, I needed to get, you know, my teeth fixed. Um, you know, we got sick. So it was, it was that, that was definitely one of those instances where I saw what we were doing were impacting, um, you know, the community way beyond music. Living out your purpose. Can, can I talk, when you said Hurricane Katrina reminded me of Hurricane Harvey, well, yeah. uh, Brandon, we worked on together. So, um, so I'll, I'll say half, you can you, say the other half. Uh, you say the whole uh, thing. I'll give a different story. You say the whole thing. Oh, you have a different story, okay. Because, yeah. well, so Brandon, I used to work at Spotify and curate Rap Caviar. And Sean G came and said, hey, let's bring Rap Caviar to life. It was a good idea. Let's, let's do it. So we did a bunch of, we did the Toronto, uh, New York, New York, New York Atlanta. Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So what happened was Hurricane Harvey happened and we were going to Houston. And then the discussion was, all these people are recovering. Is it right to come in? We can't just cancel on them. Is it right to come in and um, uh, you know, charge a whole bunch of money? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, when people yeah. probably don't have a bed to Suffer. sleep in so, because yeah, of Harvey? So, so we made a collective decision. Sean G, Brandon, Heather, uh, Brittany Lewis, uh, who's at, um, in LA. Uh, we made a collective decision, and Troy Carter, like, and, uh, we're like, hey, why don't we do this? Instead of making a traditional show, we'll, do, um, we'll show up a week early, do uh, as much community service as possible, because there were artists like Trey the Truth who were already yeah, out Trey there. Was, yeah. You know what I mean? Paul Wall was already doing stuff uh, uh, quietly. Why don't we go participate? But also, this was, this was the part that I thought was really key. Yes. <coughs> we got creative in helping the kids, because remember, this was before Christmas, too, remember? Mm -hmm. So yeah. all of a sudden, people didn't have money to, to buy Christmas gifts because they were like build, rebuilding their houses, et cetera. And we figured out creatively, uh, the, the, the team figured out, uh, it wasn't on this part, but how to subsidize the tickets so that they were accessible. So, so in a way, so all of a sudden, what seemed like a, a concert to us and, 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 and regular business, you know, was like a treat, you know? And the, when I say the entire uh, um, Houston hip hop community came and rallied, the Habitat for Humanity wow. with Von B, Food Bank with Paul Wall, we participated, we were, Trey, the truth, we were just a part of it, but, not part, but like just was like one day, but, we were so, I was so tired. He was like, yo, you come, we did all this stuff, like renovate the houses and, mm -hmm. and, and get gifts, material, um, things, people, um, uh, essential supplies. And then he kept on going, him and DJ Mr. Rogers. They kept on going, they were like, you know, we're gonna go deliver this, what, a kidney machine to this old lady. And I'm like, nah, I'm tired. Like, you know, I'm going back to the hotel. So it was even, even from an experiential perspective, and then we talked about Nipsey before. Yes. We talked about Nipsey before. There was so much that was being done. And by the way, we came in and left. They continued. The Slim wow. Thugs and them, they all continue up to, to this day. And a lot day. of the times the media doesn't expose those No, guys, not right? at all. And also, also to the, the, the artists, uh, a lot of them, like, 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 like Paul Wall, for example, when we were at the food bank, one of the ladies was telling us about all the stuff that he does off the radar. Wow. Off the radar. And, and, like completely, and then when you ask Paul Wall, it's like, yo, like how come you don't think? It's like, nah, man, it's not about that. It's you know what I mean, et cetera, et cetera. And then he could say which organizations were legit, and like literally was like, no, these guys, they're really getting food to the people. These guys are really getting this. so important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so even that part. So yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. No, and, and those Incredible. tickets that were subsidized. Just to just to finish that that point, it was ten dollars a ticket, no fees. I know there were some issues um, about ticketing fees. But um, you know, they were ten dollars a ticket, and all that money went to Trade the Truths uh, nonprofit. So you know, it's important for us. And I actually that that model is something that Live Nation Urban tries to do now, where every one of our shows moving forward, you know, we either add on you know twenty five to fifty cents a ticket, or, or we figure that part out so that 
we give back, mm. you know, with every Incredible. live show. Because it's, yes. again, what is the point? Wrap it up shows, for that, for real. No, real talk. Not, I mean, that's even part of what Broccoli City is about. We are very involved that's together. What, exactly. That's what, exactly. Broccoli City is, is tremendous in everything that it does leading up to the actual show. And yes. so I think it's, it's very important. I just want to talk about that because live shows have gotten to be increasingly expensive. I, I, we understand that. I get that. Um, but, but at the same time, that's why it was important for us to really like, how do we give back to these, local, these cities that we're in? If we're in 30 cities, let's start, you know, contributing to these cities and start helping the people. And I think part of that, you know, in my head anyway, was, you know, the, the work we did with Spotify. And just to finish all that up, I, it's very personal to me. Um, thinking about Dash and, and the program, um, we worked with uh, the Philadelphia Center for Arts and Technology, which was um, an after-school program that we ran um, with, with students, with young people in the community, whether they went to school or not. And there were kids that would come in because they wanted to learn how to produce, they wanted to learn how to make beats. And, you know, there was one child in particular who had dropped out of school who, you know, who really said, you know, honestly, fuck school. I'm not, I, I'm done. Like, I just want to be here all day. You know, he started working in the program and you know, what was it, six, seven months later, he got his GED. And he was like, if it wasn't for this program, I wouldn't have went back to school. You know, thank y'all for, thank y'all for allowing me to understand like the importance of education and, and understand why I need to go back. And it's those stories, and I got, a, I got a ton of those smaller stories, but it's those very, very personal stories, you know, because every day we're not going to be, you know, in a hurricane situation, but our communities are fucked up. And so we have to figure out ways to touch people every day, one yes. way or the other, you know what I mean? Yes. And, that's, and that's what's important. Big or small. You're fine. Yeah, I think um, that's so important. Live music definitely has been a, a huge part of my community impact work. So on a smaller level, right? So when I think about community and serving community, the most important thing is to understand who is within that community. Know your audience. Know your audience. And so for me, because I work with a lot of independent artists, some of whom are just trying to like get their music out there, they don't even know how to start finding these guys, right? So mm -hmm. I work with a lot of artists who have so much potential and they have so much that they want to offer to the world via their art. And so I learned through through my booking and through working with Live Nation and AEG and all the big ones, that artists want two things, independent artists. They want to be heard and they want to play shows. Mm -hmm. And so we developed um, a program called Test Kitchen, which is supported by the Red Bull Music Academy. And it's designed to go into various communities and find artists who want to test out their music. And so we do it on like a live music perspective. They come, they play shows. We bring out a &Rs from Rock Nation or Dream or whatever, right? And we give them this kind of um, growth and we allow them to test out their music and then as a result of that, it keeps the dollars within the community, keeps it circulating because artists get paid, they get booked on other shows, they find out other resources and how to connect to various other programs. And I realized that um, we were really making an impact because artists were really, and, and rappers too. I'm not talking about like people playing an upright bass. I'm talking about rap. Like, and not your little sister's hip hop either, you know, like real <laughs> rap music and stuff that's like not necessarily pretty and polished, but- Radio friendly, like radio dip. Or radio friendly, you know? <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that it's so important to um, recognize that artists do still need that exact same playing field and that rap is not a dirty word and that we can be impactful within our communities. And so Red Bull believed in that mission. Um, and then I realized that essentially I could just like stand on stage and blow kisses and like 1500 people would come see that, right? So how can we figure out how to be, um, use all of these people that we know and use this stage and this platform to build like a bigger opportunity for the community. And so my friends at Live Nation in Denver and my friends at AEG realized that we were like onto something because we were just selling out shows like, you know, bi-weekly, just, throwing massive bangers in Denver. I don't think they really knew what to do with that. And so I developed this program called The Blacklist. Um, and that was built from the fact that D'Angelo came to town and played the Black Messiah tour. And it was like the most incredible, beautiful tour I ever, I think I just like stood there and cried the entire time. It was like so impactful to me. And I knew so many artists who, like you said, live shows are getting more and more expensive. And I knew so many artists that I had worked with who should have been in that room and should have seen that and should have been impacted in the same way. And so um, we created this program so that 
several, lots of tickets. Um, I basically, I want everyone to be able to see live music at cost accessible means. And by cost accessible, I mean free. And I don't think that that money should come out of D'Angelo's pocket. You know, I think that the corporations and the entities that have these resources should offer it to the communities that continue to make these cities and these environments cool and who continue to like stream their music on Spotify and use YouTube and sound exchange and all these other things. And so we have developed this sort of like nationwide guest list where we have tickets to shows all over the country and we basically just give them out to everybody. So that is what I most am excited about um, is being able to work within the environment of hip hop and offer tons of um, live music opportunities and experiences for people because that is what we've seen has been most impactful within the community. Incredible. Yeah. Before I open up the floor really quick for a Q&A and we only have time for just a couple, um, I can't you know, leave out the question of the fact that we have all cried tears, whether you know out loud or silently, with the death of Nipsey Hussle. We know that he was a man on a mission. And we also know that because of his death, we've all been very inspired of how are we going to continue that marathon, right? Yeah. And that mission. Mm -hmm. Really quickly, can you guys just say one way that you guys are going to continue to live out that same message and mission that Nipsey um, carried on throughout his life before his death? Oh. I mean, I think, oh gosh, we did a lot of work also with his Vector 90 program um, in South Central. Our Los Angeles office is really connected with the Crenshaw District. Is everybody familiar with the Vector 90 program, Vector 90 program. that Nipsey started? Okay. So we were able to like really connect on that level. And so his passing really, really affected me on like the obvious levels because it's shocking and all of that. But it just felt like, you know, something was stolen from the community. And so... I don't know, whatever. But I think um, how I will continue the mission is just to keep, you know, I drive it like I stole it. You know, every single day we get up, we do this work, we do our best, and there isn't really a stopping to that. And I think that's why he was so impactful to us because so many of us are really continuing our mission by any means necessary. I would say, you know, let's, let's take a step back. Music in and of itself, hip hop is resistance music. You know, going back before that, you know what I mean? During slave times and during civil rights, we had resistance music. The way that we came together was honestly through economic empowerment. You know what I mean? So I think for us and, and utilizing Nipsey as a, you know, as someone to model after, it's really about how do we improve ourselves from it being entrepreneurs, from, from really improving ourselves economically. And I think via education, via you know, music, music is something that's ingrained in all of us and understanding the business elements of it. And, and I, I've been blessed to be around nothing but entrepreneurs in the music space. So to understand that and to understand how to do for yourself and also help others around you that look like you, because there are not a lot of executives that look like you, is, is probably the most critical thing that I, I, I can personally do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so uh, I've been thinking a lot about Nipsey, like a lot. And, and, and one of the things that, uh, that I had when, when we were gonna do this, I wanted to share was a quote I, I heard in an interview. Somebody asked Nipsey, it's like, what's your measurement of success? And he was talking about how many people I bless, right? Mm. So, so the concept, no, the concept of a millionaire is you're accumulating a million dollars, right? Is that even if, for me, the way I'll think is, uh, I'll, Nipsey's message did not die. It actually grew. It's getting bigger and bigger yeah, every and day. He, and he was a messenger. I look at him as a messenger personally. And the message, he lived it. And a lot of people, he lived it off a lot of people's radar, right? A lot of people didn't realize all of this until we lost um, uh, uh, Nipsey. And so with the whole concept of how many people we bless and the, and the concept of millionaire being accumulating a million dollars is having, so in my head it's like, okay, millionaire ambitions is blessing a million people or yeah. millions of mm -hmm. people. So even maybe, so getting to the, the, the million, going to the billion, uh, the billion, so that's, that, that's how, uh, for me, I look at um, the, the Nipsey thing is, is, is uh, adjusting things, you know what I mean? Those type of uh, metrics of success and, and, and um, to, to converting and it to blessings. That. Exactly. exactly. How do you, yeah, exa and how does that grow? <coughs> how does that have a domino effect, a ripple effect? Because know? it really does. Yeah. Uh, I mean, real quick, I think we, we need to amplify uh, the other people, because the, there's a lot of other Nipsey's out there. There's Killer yes. Mike, 
David Banner, Rhyme Fest. There's people out here doing it um, uh, in their community. So we need to amplify these people and you know, the saying, giving their roses while they're here. Yep. Um, There's a Nipsey in every city. Exactly. And we, we need to, you know, um, um, you know, just the let the world know what they're doing in those programs. Yeah, and the Great. system too. Like, yes. they, they, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. They need help. They need support. Questions? Hi, my name is Jamal Abdul Hadi. I'm a senior at the University of North Carolina. Um, I'm curious how you address, how you go about addressing and combating um, negative messages within hip hop so that they aren't negatively impacting our youth and young listeners. First of all, why you ain't in school right now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying no trouble. What you doing here? <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, uh, um, I, don't, I don't personally believe in censorship. There's a lot of uh, good, you know, th there's a lot of other positive hip hop. You just need to support that stuff. You can, you can, you can drown it out by not supporting it. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think, I think there's a, you know, there was a time though where people thought NWA was negative hip hop, but they were telling a story, uh, a real story about their environment in South Central LA. So um, I, I am not one for censorship. I just think you can, you can censor people with your, with your wallet and your eyes and ears. Um, I think as all, I feel like that question I get a lot is like a woman who works in hip hop, which is like, mm -hmm. I was glad that you started talking first because I didn't want to have to be like, my relationship <laughs> with hip hop is like one of love hate. But honestly, I think that that's the answer. So, you know, drown out the things you don't like by listening to the things you do like. And also to, you know, understanding when I think about hip hop music and rappers, I think about them from a storytelling perspective. And so sometimes that shit involves bitches and hoes and drug rap. And sometimes it involves big murder. And sometimes it involves like, backpacks and you know head wraps and I think that understanding hip-hop music is doesn't exist in a vacuum just like we as particularly as people of color we don't exist you know in a vacuum and so you have to embrace that all spectrums are going to be represented anytime you have artwork of any variety and, and let me say this I, I kind of know what you're saying too because there there's a lot of you know the, the internet and technology is great but it's also a negative because you know you buy a laptop you pretty much have a studio. So it's a lot of bullshit out there. And everybody has, uh, it makes music and you gotta sift through it and see what's real and all that other stuff. But, um, and like how the first question she asked was, you know, how did I fall in love with music? You know, it was because I think those, we were sharing music more too. Like we were, there wasn't a lot of stop, skip, fast forward. You had to listen to whole albums, mm -hmm. and you know songs. You yeah. don't know why you even know these damn That's words. That's true. Yeah. Al Green. I know all that shit, and I can't remember ever playing it. Put your purpose. finger in the tape to fast forward <laughs> it, you know? You know what I mean? So I, that is another side that I didn't want to just say, do other things. We have a question back here. Hi. Uh, so I just wanted to ask, um, somebody was talking about like uh, people like Paul Wall and uh, that when you were talking about how he was doing so much work and didn't kind of downplay it a little bit. Uh, and I'm just kind of thinking, how do you feel like people, especially artists, should draw a balance between, one, it shouldn't be about getting praise and, and everything, but at the same time, I think of someone like Nipsey, who, had he not been so vocal about what he was doing, a lot of people might have missed the message. Uh, so like, how do you draw a balance between doing something for the sake of doing it and doing it because it's the right thing and not wanting to necessarily be celebrated for something that you should be doing, uh, but also being vocal enough to be able to reach out to people and you know, share that message, share what's going on. And you know, where would you guys say? One, on an individual level, but then also like for a company or for an organization, how they can strike that balance. Brandon. Definitely your question. Brandon. Yeah. Great Brandon. question. <laughs> um, but no, let me, let, me, let, me, let me take that for a minute. So Saturday, the Saturday Nipsey died on a Sunday. Saturday, did, was anybody talking about the things that Nipsey Hussle was doing? Nope. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was. It was I, in the Texas Tech. But, on, but in a mainstream <laughs> way. <laughs> You're right, Brandon, in, in a Texas mainstream way. way. Yeah, it's back to Iowa. Uh, okay. Like, <laughs> no, but no. No, but no. But, but the, the part of that is people knew what Nipsey was doing. People that are in the know knew what Nipsey was doing. Pips, yeah. You know, I, I knew what Nipsey was doing, but I wasn't glorifying that. 
And I think that we have to, as, as a people, and something that, that Sean talked about was glorifying the people that are doing things as we find out about what they're doing. The same that we can post about Beyonce's homecoming, let's post about you know, what Paul Wall is doing True. in Houston if you find out about it. You know what I mean? We don't do enough of that. So we can talk about it all day. You know what I mean? But we just don't. We decide not to because it's not sexy. It's not something that we talk about. You know what I mean? So that's, that's something that we really need to start drilling down on. And that's on an individual level. We need to start discussing the great things that people are doing. Outside of the group chats. Outside of the group chats. <laughs> Next question over here. What's going on, panel? My name is D.Dot Omen. I'm from the DMV. I'm a platinum selling producer. Um, I had a question um, it's a quote from Ethiopia. She says, if the people working on a project don't look like the people you're trying to touch with your records, there's a problem. So my question to you guys is, how do you, are you able to have inclusion and diversity where you guys work at in your respective fields? Like Tuma, I know that you have Brittany over there. You know, how are you guys able to include like more black women and you know, people of color at the level that you guys are at? And rest in peace, the Nipsey Hustle neighborhood. So, how, how, do, how do you be more inclusive and how to include people? Well, first of all, you have to, there's, there's, there are capacity issues because you have to remember sometimes when you're in certain kind of positions, the amount of people that are hitting you up or, or, or applying for positions or uh, think it, 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 you start to have to be selective, right? And, right? And start having to pay attention. And also, you have to when you have a little bit of discretion, when, like when you're talking about Ethiopia's quote about whether you like somebody or not. If you don't like somebody, right, and you're in the music business, if their stuff is so banging and it's doing so well and it's proven itself over and over again, you kind of have no choice but to deal with it. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? You kind of have. That's a, you, you just don't. You just, this is just a reality, right? Because uh, you have to justify. So whenever you have the discretion to be present in the moment, be like, you know what? Right now, I have the ability, and I, I call them tiebreakers. When you have a whole lot of, 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 let's say, candidates, or let's say it's music, or to choose from, and uh, they're all doing around the same, it's like, hey, look, we need a little bit more of this. Or women are underrepresented. Or this is th this person or this song or this movement has been uh, n uh, not uh, recognized for these reasons. As a result, let's offset, let's counter that. You see what I'm saying? So it's kind of, I think, it's being present in the moment, being aware of the landscape, and, when, and knowing when you have that discretion, when you have that ability, because you only get those every once in a while. And also, I'll say, like, I, I, I do the reverse. Like, if I see a HBCU resume, I'm moving it up to the top. I'm gonna look at it a little harder. If I see, I see Aisha, some Keisha's. I'm a, you know, if I, if I just saw Brandon Panky Pen, I'd be like, eh. I get it. I get it. I get it. But but no, but you gotta you gotta you gotta balance that thing out. You know, we just hired Priscilla. She worked with me right here. You know, so she, I, I didn't meet her at first. They was like, Sean, we need you to meet Priscilla. I was like, she black. Yeah, so anyway, but she was excellent too. That's the other thing we gotta be too. There's black excellence, and some of that shit ain't black excellence. So we gotta have honest conversations. You, you need tickets for uh, Broccoli City tomorrow, don't you? <laughs> yeah, okay. Dad, oh, child, I must have missed your panel at my conference. He wasn't talking all that shit. Uh, what's up? I'm Bird. Um, I own a, a brand here called Made in the DMV. Um, and I feel like we have a very, very good movement. Um, my question is, Really for Rue and for Live Nation, um, Toma too. Um, as we go on and we build, we sell out shows, we sell out conferences, but I wanna know how did you make them believe and like, I deal with a lot of independent artists, you know what I'm saying? So I might send a deck over and I'm like, yo, we got Washington Slizzards and I'll use them cause they're in the building. And they're like, I know they have a hell of a movement here, you know what I'm saying? But I might send it to like Live Nation and they like, who? So, you know what I'm saying, how did you get them to believe that? And then what's the first step that you look at for a brand? Because I've been told so many different things from pictures to, you know, I need to have like the big panelist, um, I need to have the video, and the deck needs to be on point. So what, and I, like I got great friends, like 
do you guys like great to me. Like, Broccoli City is great. I'm pretty sure our conference will eventually get there. You know, I've got like Tuma started off at Revolt how, when we met. And then I was like, all right, cool. We're going to have Revolt involved with the conference next year. Then he moved to Spotify. And I was like, all right, cool. We're going to have Spotify. And then he was like, I'm at YouTube. And I was like, shit. <laughs> like, so what is it? <laughs> like, just, just giving me some advice, Rue, because I know you probably have, you know what I'm saying, a lot when you come with dealing with brands. And re I've done with Real Bull, re I've dealt with Real Bull too as well. So I'm just saying, just, just a little bit of tips and advice. Yeah, I think the most important thing with any amount of branding is consistency and accuracy. So that comes with understanding how things work within the industry. So I also, because I work with a lot of indies, they'll be like, they'll come into my office and they're like, oh, I want, you know, that. And it'll be like a magazine with like Lil Wayne on the front, you know? And it's like, how did he get to that point? Instead of just thinking like, oh, you met the guy from Live Nation, so surely he'll be able to put me on tour with Jay-Z, right? So just understanding like how it works and also um, the domination of your environment, which is like a whole other level of talks that we can have at some other point. But you have to dominate the environment that you're in before you can think to like move to the next level so if you and your music artists you know it, I call it all about like playing the pipeline so the first thing is to establish the environment that you're in work within that environment and to build out the people who know you the people who love you and who will evangelize on your behalf then you have to find the people who know them and then the people who don't know that they don't know you and the people who don't know that they don't know that they don't know you mm -hmm. okay and then you can say like by that time the booking agent or the you know curator of the hottest mm -hmm playlist or whatever, they will know about what you're doing because your movement has gotten so big. So I also, you know, I think it's great record labels and all the other ways that artists want to get signed. But honestly, if you can't create an independent movement that is completely sustainable on its own, mm -hmm. and then you're kind of like shooting yourself in the foot before you even start. So that's like, and also if you can pay someone to do something, you have to know how to do that thing yourself first. Mm. Wait, wait, also, she said dominate. I, I, I'm going to give a real life, this is customized to Bird and Made in TV, is uh, also translate, right? You have to remember, the people that you're pitching to aren't out in the streets like you. You, you know you see what I'm saying? They're, they're, they're in a different culture. They're in a different sure. corporate environment. They have people they're accountable to that they have to justify their decisions for, and I'll give you, this is why I say it's customized to you, and we won't use names, we won't use names, right? So, Bird reaches out to me about something for being made in DMV. I was, uh, there, there was a, a conflict, so I wasn't able, but I referred someone who I think was good. It was good? Yeah. Okay, good, very good. So, I reached out to that person. I was like, hey, this is, uh, I, I've, I've done work with made in DMV. They're, they're really good, it's legit. They got this thing, Anacostia, like it's like it's amazing, etc. And then that person was like, "All right, cool, just put 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 them in touch." And then what happened was that person's uh, the person that person reported to was like, "What is this?" And then that person literally had to come back to me. It's like, "Hey, I just need some more information. I'm getting it from her, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera, right? Because that world was a whole different world, and that person couldn't care less about the DMV, the, the person, the, the, not him, but the, the person that he reported, couldn't care less about what was happening. They're like, okay, no, we're, we need things that are only operating at this level. You see what I'm saying? And then literally, he came back, ammunition from you, ammunition from me, went back and said, hey, I'm gonna do this, et cetera, et cetera. And then he even hit me afterwards like, yo, good luck, that was a great experience. You know, I met really, there was great energy, et cetera, et cetera, it was real. Etc. So the translation part, always remembering that when you're uh, telling your story, that it's also in the language of the, the recipient of the story. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? That it's, and it, always having that in mind. And, and for people like me, I work in like office environment, like, and I'm in the tech culture. It's a whole different culture than the media culture that I came from. Is, and, and, and I have like culture shocks and, and culture clashes. Et cetera, et cetera. Like literally, like what do you mean? Like this is so, this is a no-brainer. Like no, ta 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 ta. You know, and, and so 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 it's a, this is constant uh, 
constant, it never stops. So, so yeah, translate also. I think that's super. I just to piggyback on that, it's yeah. so important the translating and speaking the language of the people that you're pitching to. And I learned that coming from like a political and a journalistic background. But yes, Red I Bull, can relate. Like, I couldn't just march in there and be like, I want you to fund my like all female Wu Tang cover band. Like they don't even know what <laughs> yeah. that means. You know, they had no. They they were literally like, this girl's wearing a lot of jewelry. That was like what they were thinking. <laughs> so in order to be able to to do you have to know like I'm like no the Red Bull Music Academy is designed to support and break music and this is a project that does that so any branding especially with the indies like know who you're talking to know your cow before you make beef like whatever that works yeah I'm horrible with no, and I just want to add my two cents to wrap things up in the sense of I can relate to that with being in the news world when Nipsey died I had to go into meetings and explain why it deserves X, Y, and Z coverage, why he matters so much to the community, why his death means so much, and not just, oh, why is he trending? What happened to him? So I can totally relate to knowing your audience and how to speak to them in a way where they will get it. Because we all can relate. We are all universal at the end of the day. We just have to figure out how to you know, speak properly, whether you're talking to a president, whether you're talking to an intern, we got to make sure that we adjust and align accordingly. And, and with that being said, I mean, I feel so inspired. I don't know about you guys in the room by the conversation that we had today. I thank you guys so much for joining us. What you guys talked about truly does matter. And I know you guys will be around at the conference. So you guys can definitely network with them. This is what the conference is all about. And we will get started with our next panel shortly. Thank you guys so much for joining us. DJ, turn that nip back on. Thanks.